Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is it, in it the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the faith. You and message. I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. Barbara. Jesus died to save sinners, and you are a sinner. The following program is filmed live at Grace Community Church in Fort Worth, Texas, as part of their monthly crosstalk service. I am thankful. thankful to be here, and uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Hallelujah, I am blessed. I know Christ Jesus died for me. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. By grace alone I'm free. Christ has atoned for me. By grace alone I have a home with God eternally. With confidence I say, His Spirit will guide my way. God will empower me every hour to live and serve today. By faith, I'm saved today. By the life, the truth, the way, my faith in him now hides my sin. That faith allows me to say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Give thanks and proclaim, I'm blessed. Salvation's mine by God's design. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And today, I will ask you if salvation is yours. Are you free from your sins? In Christianese, are you saved? Now, I am here to preach because the real preacher isn't in town. But first, I want to tell you a story. And I want to say thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your prayers for me. Thank you for your prayers for my lovely bride, Adrienne. We've both had a bit of a roller coaster in the last couple of months. Hence, the title of my message is Hospitals, Helpers, and Hell. <laughs> but I do sincerely want to thank those of you who have prayed for us. And um, so I bought a Jeep. Okay? Um, and it's pretty cool. I decided I wanted to do some off-roading stuff and explore more dirt roads. Um, I, I am the guy that says, here, hold my coffee. Uh, and then I want to see what happens. And I wanted to just go out and get filthy dirty and then go eat cheeseburgers and tacos. And my wife said I could. So... I was a little, you know, I thought about it, that I'm going to be out in weird places by myself, and, you know, what if I get stuck? And uh, I didn't want to get stuck out in the middle of nowhere alone. And I thought about it, and I uh, decided I needed to get a winch so that if I 
you know, went through some washed out road and ended up stuck. I could winch myself out. And uh, so then this ice storm hit. And I thought, uh, I'd, I'd ordered the winch and I'd asked a couple of fellas that do Jeep stuff if they'd put the winch on for me. And they had it done and this ice storm came and I thought, I need to go pick up my Jeep because maybe I could pull some people out of ditches and tell them Jesus loved them. <laughs> you can't pull someone out of a ditch if you're in a ditch. <laughs> okay? And that, that goes for your life. If you want to be someone who helps other people, you have to have your life together. If you're living in a ditch, you're not going to be able to help someone out. You can help them get into a ditch because you know how, to got, how you got there, but you're not going to be able to help them out. So I went to pick the Jeep up. I was meeting the fellas. Uh, the winch was done, and I drove my wife's car, and I was parking it, and I was going to drive the Jeep home. And I pulled up, and I saw my Jeep in the parking lot, and man, I felt 40 years old. And I got out of the Jeep, and I took two steps, and I hit a patch of ice. And I was on my back, and I couldn't move. And I went from 40 to 100 in a matter of <laughs> seconds. So, true story. Strange things go through your mind when you're just in the worst pain you've ever experienced. And, and I'm laid out and I, I could move my feet, I could move my arms, but I couldn't move anything in between. And I thought I'd ruined the rest of my life. It was a terrible feeling. And uh, the fellas that had put the winch in, they came over and, you know, they saw what happened and, and they, they, are you okay? Are you okay? And I really couldn't move. And uh, they said, do you want me to call 911? I said, no, I, 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 and then I thought for a minute, I can't move. And I, I said, y y yeah, C call 911. And I said, but uh, can, I need to call my wife. And I could hardly talk, and it was really awful. And I was terrified to call my wife because I had been caring for her for probably the last month because she had fallen off a small ladder and had fractured her leg. And, I mean, she couldn't hardly move for some weeks. It was, <clears throat> it was difficult. And I knew I didn't want to have to call and tell her, but I, I knew I had to, and I, I, I said, honey, I... I, uh, I fell on the ice and an ambulance is coming to take me to, the, and she was just having a hard time. And, uh, and I, I couldn't hardly talk because it was just so hard. It hurt, I hurt so bad. And uh, she called my oldest son, Ben. And uh, I'm laid out there, and the strangest things go through your mind. Hi, I'm Randy Weiss, and I want to tell you a little bit about a Passover backstory and our do-it-yourself Passover. These are incredible tools to help you discover the connection between the sacrifice of Jesus and the Jewish Passover. In the pages of these books, we not only share the prayers and rituals of Passover, but we provide a, a real guided tour of the Passover Seder. And you can hear the clear injunction that Passover is for Jewish and non-Jewish families using the scriptures to deeply explore and explain this festival. Get your copy today. You can find out more at www.doityourselfpassover.com. The ambulance came and, uh, well, first the fellows came, you know, the, the guys from the, my Jeep friends, and I said, uh, are you guys praying people? 
And, and they said, yeah. I said, well, would you please pray for me? And so they prayed a wonderful Pentecostal prayer, and I, I was very thankful, but I still couldn't move. And the ambulance got there, and Ben got there within moments of the ambulance, and they uh, put me on a gurney and moved me to the ambulance. And they started asking me questions, you know. And I, I just told them, I said, look, uh, I want to want you to know Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. Do you, you know Jesus? And uh, one of the things I thought about was that I'm, didn't think I'd ever get to be able to preach the gospel again, to stand at a pulpit and tell people, Jesus changed my life, and he's still in the life-changing business. The other thing I started thinking was, I've lived my whole life, and I've never been in an ambulance. <laughs> I thought, I'm so thankful how can somebody live this long and never have been in an ambulance? So what a blessing. What a blessing. And uh, they got me to the hospital and I saw all these people in the waiting room and they just took me right past everyone. And they asked me a few more questions and then I'm in a room. And I'm sitting, laying there, and I'm thinking, what a blessing. How good is God? There's all these people who are caring for me. Right now, they're helping me right now. And there's so many people who aren't getting any help right now. And they're helping me. And I realized what favor and what blessing, what goodness God has provided. And there's so many people out there who are alone hurting. And I'm there and my son is right by my side. And I'm thinking, oh, how, th how thankful I am to have a family that loves me. And I'm not alone. And a wife who cares and she's worried. And I know she would be there if she could. I'm not alone and I'm loved and I'm blessed and I'm saved. How many people are going to not come out of that hospital and they're not saved? And all these nice ladies were coming and, and hurting me real bad doing things. <laughs> and, you know, what medicine do you take? I don't know, you have to ask my wife. <laughs> Who's your doctor? I don't know. My <laughs> wife knows. Have you ever done this? Have you ever? I said, look, ma'am. You can fill all those things as yes if you want to go back far enough. Because I did all those things. But I don't do those things anymore because Jesus changed my life. I'm not a drug addict. I'm saved. I'm delivered. And I'm going to heaven if I don't get out of here. Can you say the same? So, they took a bunch of x-rays and they said, we have to go take a CAT scan. I said, and it was so hard to talk. And I couldn't move. And I said, ma'am, you, you could take a CAT scan, but I promise you, you won't find a single cat. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, it hurt so bad. <laughs> and they laughed.
So they did everything, and they came back, and they said, uh, there's nothing broke. I'm thinking, what? Wait, I'm not going to die? <laughs> and I, I told my son, I said, I'm going to get better. I've never in my whole life hurt like I hurt ever in my whole life. I said, how thankful, how thankful I am that I have lived this long and I have never hurt like this ever one time. And I'm serious because some people live with hurt constantly. And I could never remember hurting like that. And uh, I said, so if nothing's broke, can I go home? And I couldn't move. And they thought about it, and I, they couldn't come up with a reason why they couldn't stop me from going home. So I told Ben, as soon as the ladies moved out of the room, I said, before anybody changes their mind, you get me out of here and get me home. <laughs> and uh, he did. And I almost passed out putting my trousers on. I, f I f ended up on all fours on the floor. And I was afraid that they would come back and see that I was on the floor. <laughs> and then they'd make me stay. Ben got back before that happened. And he took me home. And then I had to go back because they said, you have to go see the doctor. I went back to the doctor, and they said uh, they were going to let me go from the doctor. And my wife said, you know, he's pretty swollen in, in, in his back. And the doctor, she was just ready to let me go. <laughs> and my wife had said that. <laughs> and the doctor came over, and she put her hand on my back, and she says, oh, you have subcutaneous air pockets. I said, what's a subcutaneous air pocket? And she said, well, that, that there's air that has under your skin. I, I was like, okay. What do they do for that? <laughs> and she says, well, I have to call the other doctor. And, I, and the way she said it, it was like, I don't want to tell you what they're going to do. <laughs> So she called the other doctor. The other doctor came in. The other doctor put her hand on my, and he, she said, you have subcutaneous emphysema. I said, okay, what do they do for subcutaneous emphysema? And she wouldn't tell me. She said, you have to get to the emergency room right now. And so my son took me right back to the emergency room and they walked me and Right away, they had me back in another room, passing all these lonely people who were hurting in the waiting room. I'm in a room. They're coming. They're hurting me. They're doing all the things they're supposed to do. They're plugging me and stuff. And they're taking me for more x-rays, and they're taking me for more wasted time because there's not any cats. <laughs> and they come back, and they say, your x-ray's clear. And then they come back, and they said, the CAT scan showed that you have a deflated lung and a, and a broken rib. And I said, can I go home? <laughs> and they said, you need to talk to the doctor. So the doctor came in and the doctor says, you have a deflated lung and there's two things we can do. And he said, one of them is, we can put in a chest tube, and he says, but you need to know that if I do that, you're going to say to me, with all the advances in modern medicine, how come something so barbarian is still being done to people? <laughs> and he said, or maybe it will heal itself. I said, I'd like it to heal <laughs> itself. And he says, then I'm going to have to keep you here. And I said, doctor. You need to understand something. I said Jesus changed my life, and he's still in the life-changing business, and I want to go home. <laughs> I said, in more than 49 years, apart from the six times my wife went into the hospital to have a baby, we've never spent the night apart. I would like to go home. He said, about that chest tube. <laughs>
And I said, can my wife come here? And he said, sure, I'll put you in a room and make sure that your wife can come here. I said, deal. And so... Oy vey, Passover starts very soon, but you can keep calm and use this do-it-yourself Passover to have your own Haggadah, which is now available, in ebook at www.doityourselfpassover.com. It's perfect for those wanting to experience a, a Passover full of new understanding. So head over to the site and grab your copy today. Again, find out more at www.doityourselfpassover.com. And my lovely bride came and stayed with me, and they kept hurting me. And I, I still didn't know if I was ever going to be able to come and preach the gospel again or go drive my Jeep in the mud. But I can. And I will, because I am healed, and God is good. I wanted to wear a t-shirt today to come and preach to you, but that would have been inappropriate, and the message I'm going to bring you, you're probably not going to like anyway, and I didn't want to compound that by walking into church in <laughs> jeans and a t-shirt, but I took a picture of the t-shirt that I wanted you to see. And the t-shirt says, Welcome to hell. Abandon hope beyond this point. Don't worry, our church voted three to one that this doesn't exist. Okay, a lot of people don't believe in hell. Most people believe in hospitals. Most people believe in helpers. I'm thankful for helpers. I'm thankful for my son who cared for me and helped me. The moment he came to help me, his wife, Crystal, went to help my wife because she knew Crystal, uh, Crystal knew that Adrian would be hysterical or that's not the right word, but <laughs> she'd be very sad and scared yes. and confused. And so Crystal babysat Adrian while Ben came and babysat me I'm thankful for helpers, for all the ladies at the hospital that hurt me. I'm thankful for the doctors who threatened and scared me. I'm thankful for the kindness shown by the ambulance drivers and everybody else. I'm thankful for helpers. When I got home, I knew I had a concern that I was supposed to be preparing to go to a convention. National Religious Broadcasters Association, which I have, I serve on the board of directors and I haven't missed a NRB convention in, I don't know, since 1995 or 1996. And it's really important for our ministry and, and it's really important for our nation that there are free independent voices to tell a lost dying world that Jesus changed my life and he's still in the life changing business. And we need outlets to be able to do that. And my family and I have been outside of our ministry also developing a tech company to be able to platform free independent voices to declare Jesus is Lord. And we had a big presentation we were going to be putting on there and I wasn't going to be able to go. And I called a friend, I called Leo. I said, Leo, could you go to the NRB to represent me because I can't be there? And he, he, what do you want me to do? You know, when is it? How long is it? So I, I said, it's going to take about a week and you're going to need to do this. That. And he said, okay, I will go do that for you. I'm thankful for helpers. God provides helpers. Leo wants to help me. My son wants to help me. My wife wants to help me. My other children want to help me. I'm thankful for helpers. I called a dear friend in the broadcast industry, Mark, and his wife, Kathy, and I said, we're putting on this presentation about ATSC 3.0, who Mark is sort of the, the godfather of this new technology for our nation's broadcast systems. 
every one of you will be watching TV on an ATSC 3 standard TV in the very near future. My friend is the one who kind of is responsible for having helped develop it and get it the new standard in place. And I said, could you attend this convention to look at our presentation? And he, he's a very busy, very important guy, runs a big company. And uh, he stopped what he was doing and took his wife to go to the convention to, to be there. I'm so thankful for helpers. I'm blessed by hospitals and doctors. I'm blessed by helpers. I'm blessed by God. And I'm going to go to heaven. Some people are going to go to hell. Contrary to what some in the church may suggest isn't even real. There are people outside the church who have no concept of hell. There are people inside the church who don't believe there's such a thing as hell. God wouldn't do that to people. I'm telling you, they will do that to themselves. It's a binary decision. Binary decisions are real. Contrary to culture. I mean, the light is on or it's off. Okay? Contrary to, when I went into the hospital, they had all these forms, and I looked to one of the forms. I didn't do anything. I mean, my son or my wife did everything. But at one point, they, I had to sign something, and the, I looked at the form, and it said right on there, uh, gender. And you know <laughs> what this thing said? It said, assigned at birth. <laughs> I couldn't believe my eyes. I just, I wanted to just say, excuse me. <laughs> it's a binary thing. You're a boy or you're a girl. I mean, you're wise or you're foolish. You're saved or you're not. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. It's binary. And I want people to know it's that simple. It's not a complex mess. You don't need to be a physicist or a geologist or an archaeologist or a theologian. It's like yes or no. You know, like check the box. And you're supposed to know if you're going to heaven or if you're going to hell.